Hey guys, it's Luton here, and today a bit of a podcast. Haven't done podcasts for a while, uh, but I know that many of you uh, enjoyed them very much when I did Roundtable and some of the other things that I've done discussions with when I did discussions with Minx. Um, today, joined by Flame, Flame Fang in my squad. You guys know him already. Um, we're going to be talking about Star Wars. Obviously, the new film is out, but I'm talking about Star Wars today more because my curiosity is peaked with some theories and speculations that are flying around and I ended up late tonight just like trawling through YouTube finding some videos a couple that were surprisingly uh, plausible I was really like I, I thought they were going to be absolute nonsense but actually it sort of piqued my interest and thought wow that is actually something worth thinking about but with all speculations it's so sort of spurious there's no real uh, thing to pin down there but I think we'll start off by talking about the new film a little bit and just raking it through I mean you guys know there's been a million reviews out there but I thought it'd be interesting still to just share our thoughts and just talk about it really um Flame let's just start with the new film what did you think of it um I guess my sort of quick soundbite response would be that I enjoyed the movie uh overall in many ways uh, but it, it it was a sort of good movie, but it was a sort of a poor story uh, and a poor premise because it just repeated what was already done uh, in the previous movies. It's in every sense it is Star Wars, but it's not sort of creative or expanding. And as somebody who really enjoyed a lot of the work surrounding the Star Wars movies, the expanded universe, Star Wars Legends, it felt very bland because I'd seen it done before. And there's to me, there's so much more to Star Wars than what was already in the movies. And I know for some people there's a lot of nostalgia value to that, but to me, it just didn't come together in the way I think it did for some other people. Yeah, it's like I'm not the most hardcore Star Wars fan. I think we should post that out there because there's probably going to be some people who are like, no, they at point two six three they didn't do this, and it's like, yeah, I know. And and then there's the complete opposite of that kind of fan for Star Wars, the kind of people who really just want to go to see a shooty, spacey, blasty character full time, and that's that's all they want out of the film. Um, to me, I you know, it's interesting. A lot of the first three films as well, I think they were not as bad as a lot of people said. I really don't. Um, I, I I think there's a lot of laudable elements to the first three films, and I think George Lucas doesn't really deserve a lot of the appalling uh, sort of abuse that he gets around that. I don't think they were by any means like what you could call bad, especially when you look around at you know it, for me, for myself, someone who has watched a lot of science fiction films, um, they they are far from being a bad film, you know, because there are some absolute diabolical shocking films out there but i suppose what people would say counter to that is well within the context of star wars movies but talking about the new film within relation to that um the new film as you say yeah it was a big nostalgia trip i think the best sort of explanation that i saw for it um was probably something along the lines of a soft reboot uh we're looking at other films that have been doing this lately stuff like jurassic park jurassic world you know they're really like hey uh we want to kickstart a new series and instead of just remaking movies they're like hey we've got an idea instead of just remaking movies let's remake one movie and then kickstart new films off of that. So this seems to be like kind of Hollywood's uh, new plan is that instead of coming up with uh, ingen you know, good new ideas, they'll kickstart it with you know that nostalgia factor, like you know, uh, let's build it. And Jurassic World was built all around that. You know, it was like here's the big nostalgia, and then they'll probably spin out a few more off of that. And it's starting to feel like uh, this you know new Star Wars film did that essentially. Um, I think with that said, there's like a lot that it has to do in the next couple of films. And again, this is something like everybody has said. Um, but again, you know, just relating it back, one of the huge criticisms, I think, uh, of the first couple of films was that there was so much CGI. There's tons of CGI in the new films as well. Yeah, they did use some like uh, live action stuff as well. But, you know, I guess uh, one thing that was really good about it, though, that I loved was the, the visceral feel of it. You know, the sort of combat mm. and a lot of the things with the crashing and stuff like this, it felt very physical. Um, and I didn't get so much of that from the first three films, one, two, three. Um, there wasn't so much of that because I guess, uh, but I mean, wouldn't you agree that a large part of the look and feel of it is because CGI has come forward so much since those first three films? I mean, it's been quite a while. When did uh, three come out? I don't even remember when. It's been quite a while though, hasn't it? 2005? Yeah, it's like a long time, right? Well, yeah, I mean, about 10 years. <laughs> Which is definitely quite a while. Um, what do you what do you think about that though? Just in terms of like graphics moving forward, and then how that affects the feel of it. I mean, for example, do you think that the first film and the first the first two three films would have been so harshly criticised if they'd had the level of CGI that they do now? And that because the CGI now is very clever. 
it looks more integrated. So it's much, much, much more difficult to tell what is CGI and what is not. Because when you look at the CGI in those first three films, it's almost like, um, you know how in old school cartoons you can tell when something is a cell and something is a background? You know, like, mm. in, you know, I'm talking about like old school animation, right? And and often when a scene, you're looking at a scene in an, in an old animation, an old Disney or something like this, you can tell you're like, oh, that object's going to move because you can, it looks a little bit different. You know, it looks, it looks like it's a transparency on top of something because it physically is right. Um, but in those first three films, the first three Star Wars films, again, very similarly, you can tell it doesn't look quite integrated. That's why I never really bought into some of the kind of like newer dinosaur stuff which came after jurassic park because it just didn't you know that cgi was not of a level which is as good as we are used to now in 2015 it doesn't look that level of sort of almost like um tonal integration you know it's it's all about the mm. light usually you can tell the light the way in which it sort of sits and if you look at it it doesn't it, it looks sort of stuck on and therefore looks fake and artificial but the new cgi it's so much more advanced now that you really have a job to kind of tell. I mean, you look at movies that have come out, stuff like Avatar and things like this that have been coming forward. The CGI is like so far advanced now by comparison. Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, I'd agree with that. Uh, like I said, I have, I'd have two big things in response. One, um, if you actually look back at the original Star Wars movies now without all of the editing that was done afterwards, you know, more recently by yeah. George Lucas, um, some of those scenes that are done with like uh, sort of practical effects do look kind of weird. Um, not terrible, but you can sometimes tell that there are practical effects, you know, in use that are essentially creating illusions. Yeah. And I think to a degree, you could say that the same thing is kind of true in the newer movies, except that you have to sort of suspend your, your disbelief yeah. in a slightly different way. You're talking about like explosions uh, and some of the blaster effects and things like that, right? You can, you can almost physically see it, can't you, when you look at it? that it's sort of yeah. laid, laid on, you know? I mean, it's like groundbreaking at the time, but again, when you sort of look at the newer stuff every day and then you suddenly watch those old ones back and you go, wow, they do look actually way more dated than I thought they would. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, my perspective may be a little bit skewed because when the first movies that, that you know, the one, two, and three came out, I was quite young. So to me, the CGI actually didn't look all that bad because I guess, I, you know, maybe I was so engrossed in it, you know, I can't really say. But looking back, yes, they, they do look kind of awkward. But at the time, uh, I didn't have too much trouble with them. And I have to wonder whether, you know, 10 years from now, people look back at this movie and say, wow, those effects look kind of dated. Um, I know they, they did use a lot of practical effects in this movie. And I agree, they, they did look quite good. I think it was um, a good balance, you know. It was a good balance of, like, yes. old and new. Whereas I think uh, George Lucas went, I mean, like I say, I don't have as big of an issue with those first three films as many people do. Like, I, I'm, mm. I'm, I'm cool with them. Like, I'm fine. I don't have a huge critique of them there. Um, but I think he went a bit overboard. He went a bit crazy. Because uh, George Lucas, he is a fairly experimental uh, filmmaker. Because when you uh, see, what is it? Is it THX? I always forget because the numbers. What's the movie? Uh, let me look it up. It's... Uh, uh, THX uh, 1138 uh, was his first mm. film, and uh, it's a hugely experimental film. Um, it's all about this kind of really weird dystopian world uh, where everyone is kind of... It's very kind of like... Um, I don't know what kind of movie it would be a mix of, um, but basically it's this kind of horrific world in which humans kind of live this sort of almost... Um, f what would it be? Production line experience of living where they're kind of almost like in cells and they're not really allowed to have feelings they can only have children if it's been authorized it's a very kind of like 1984 mixed uh mm. with some other sort of things along, along those lines you know um and anyway it's a really bizarre weird world but it's such an experimental film really really interesting uh for the time and um he he likes to push the boundaries and and sort of explore things now people are going to laugh at that and go what george lucas he likes to push the boundaries but he does in his own way you know he likes to create and he's a, he's a creator that's why he came up with star wars in the first place that's why it was so groundbreaking in the first place and i think what happened with the first three films is he just went a bit kind of overboard it was like you know a child with new toys it's just like oh my god all the things you know i've got to do all the stuff and he kind of was like right well we've got all this new stuff let's see what we can do with it and he just kind of went overboard and and that's the mm. trouble cgi is not something that you should go that overboard with to that degree unless it's specifically for that okay unless you're doing a specific movie 
which is CGI, like Toy Story, Avatar. You know, you're going like, this is a CGI film. Well, that's different because then it doesn't look out of place because it's all the same. So then it's fine. But when you're putting the two things together, it can be really jarring, especially when there's a lot of it going on, you know. Um, and it tends yeah. to, all, all it is, is it's all it is, is it's those, it's those scenes where there's, you know, live and CGI. But for example, in the first three films, when it's scenes where there's like, it's all in space, or maybe they're having like the pod racing and stuff like this, um, that doesn't look out of place because there's more CGI going on. So therefore it kind of looks okay. But it looks weird when you have a lot of live action and a lot of CGI together. Then it looks kind of strange because it's a bit more jarring, you know. Um, and I think that was less of an issue with the new film, right? But um, yeah. what do you think about uh, character-wise and stuff? We'll talk about the story in a second. Um, but what was your kind of feel about the characters? Um, I'll just in like a soundbite way, I'll just say that I liked um, a lot of the new characters in the new film and I felt like they definitely harped back more to uh, episode four um, in terms of their, not again, not the story yet, but more in terms of their personality their demeanor you know it was a bit more like rough and tumble action adventure whereas the first three films were like oh we're being star wars you know that kind of thing yeah i agree i i actually enjoyed the characters by and large um i'd say kylo ren might be a little bit of an exception to that um and i think there were some serious naming problems with uh lord snoke i think it is yeah what the hell with uh, that just, doesn't, just doesn't sound remotely threatening um you know you've got darth sidious darth Plagueis or whatever, Darth Vader, and and there's Lord Snoke, and it, you yeah. know, it just doesn't sound the same. Um, but yeah, I enjoyed the characters. I think um, I'm Snoke sounds like there. a Snoke sounds like a kind of item of clothing or something. You know, what is oh, it? I think there's like a fish. there's like that thing you put around your neck, like that's like a little warmer. I think it's called like a snook or something, isn't it? I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah, it kind of makes me think of that. It's just like you don't think like, "Oh Jesus, he's coming!" Like it's, just, it's not particularly intimidating. You think like Darth Vader is coming, like, "Holy shit, let's get out of here!" Uh, Snook is coming. You're like, "What?" Who cares? <laughs> like, it doesn't sound intimidating. Who the hell is that? It's like a, like a Disney cartoon or something, a little bit. Yeah, it's weird. Um, I don't know. And then you've got his massive holographic projection or something. I thought that's. I thought when I first saw that, I thought that's how big he was. Yeah, I was like, dude, <laughs> this guy is massive. But it's like, yeah. no, no, it's just Why does a hologram. The force of he's that big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's just a hologram. So he must have some kind of like serious Napoleon complex going on. Or something. Well, especially when the only people that are seeing him are like the people who directly, clearly, maybe have met him already. Yeah. So it's like, <laughs> are you doing this just to like really lord it over them? Unless he genuinely is that big, and like <laughs> for whatever reason, I don't know. I don't see why he has like be a bit bigger, but that's like really, really, really big. Yes. It's like, like he's as big as like the Lincoln Memorial or something, right? Yeah. He's like that big. You know? That's huge. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's what they were harping it to, you know? Like trying to be a bit of a you know sort of cultural comparison going on or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so the new film overall. I mean, this is the trouble. It's like really what you can say about it. I mean, when you get into the story, damn, I should have said like spoilers. Uh, people don't care about spoilers now. The film's been out long enough, you know, whatever. I'll put like a little graphic on this, the thing that says spoilers. But like um, spoilers now, guys. Um, the story, though. I mean, the story of the film is so obviously, I mean, so many people have compared it. It, it is episode four. You can't get away from it. I don't care what people say and the sort of complete fanboys who are like, no, it's, no, it's it, it's episode four. There's no getting away from it. Mm -hmm. But I think, I don't really understand why they did that. Um, whether it's just an accessibility thing, whether it's the fact that they really wanted to like make sure they took no risks whatsoever on the nostalgia factor, I don't know. It is super odd that it followed so, so similarly though. I mean, have you got any kind of rationalization about it um i think perhaps they saw it as the easiest way to draw together two of their largest demographics which are old older people who saw the movies originally and are going to be pulled by that nostalgia factor and younger essentially kids uh, you know i don't know what ages specifically but probably you know young children to teenagers who never really saw the original movies probably like the eight-year-old girl who was like kicking me in the back for like half the film like when i was there <laughs> seriously i had to turn around in the cinema and say to her father i was like can she stop kicking me please because like through the entire first half this girl was just like kicking the back of my chair and i just lost it it was just like 
<laughs> I was just like, for Christ's sake. Like, uh, when I saw the film, I had to get up like 5.45 a.m., go into central London, because it was the only IMAX viewing that I could get, okay? Movie starts at like whatever absurd time of day it was, like 6.45, 6.45 it was, or 7.45 or something it was. Um, so half past, I think it was like half past seven in the morning. And then this girl's like kicking my chair, and I was just like, for oh, fuck's sake. Like, oh, just, yeah. And I tolerated it as long as possible because I'm British and I don't want to cause a scene, you know? But it's <laughs> like, you know, I, I'm going to take that punishment because I don't want to say any harsh words. But yeah, after sort of about 30 minutes, I was like, I've had enough of this. But yeah, it was fine. I didn't have a shout at the girl, though. I just said to her father sternly, please, can she stop kicking me? And that was good enough. But, um, <laughs> yeah, so that kind of age demographic is probably where they're targeting it at, you know? Right, yeah, people who perhaps aren't as serious about the movies or haven't... I mean, I've had a surprising number of people that have sort of come out in the past few days uh, saying they just haven't seen Star Wars at all. Um, what, any like, of the to, previous to ones me, as well? Any of them, at all. Of what, of what age range? Like our age range or...? Uh, older people or it was a pretty big mix it was people uh, teenagers partially like one of my brother's friends um, through people my age through to somebody about 40 years old I find that like so weirdly unbelievable I cannot believe that the amount of times it's on television just like by default and yeah that's a strange thing indeed but then you see they have no point of reference so they can't even they won't even think it oh it's bad or whatever they'll just be like it's amazing and it's just like exactly and i I think that's why they're why it is essentially enabled them to appeal to two demographics at the same time and so we're perhaps in a position or at least i'm in a position probably you as well but we're sort of in the middle and so we're, we're not getting either of those points of appeal here's the thing like i didn't hate it it's not like i came out and was like jesus man because everybody knows like i can be pretty harsh about things and and very cynical but i think this is the key like uh, there was it's okay to dislike stuff you know i i I came out of it i didn't come out of it thinking like jesus christ what a waste of money like no i enjoyed it i was like "Ah, damn that was good uh, star Mm -hmm. wars film but then you know i thought about it some more and i was like you know when they had the huge planet thing i was just like really like what the hell um I like the idea of it, like, drawing energy from the sun, apart from the fact that, like, it's an inherently, like, super, super insanely dangerous thing to do. But, like, <laughs> as, in, as it ultimately proved. But, you know, and all the issues that go along with taking energy from a sun and what might happen to it thereafter, you know, in terms of, like, kind of horrific um, implosions or whatever, I don't know. Um, I don't have the science reference to hand, but, you know, killing a sun can't be a good thing, you know. Um but yeah it seemed like uh, i just they could have surely like tried a little bit to do the same story but not the same story you know mm. cuz a lot of films do that sometimes you know they they'll they'll be inspired by other movies and then they take elements from it and things you know um, sure. you look at stuff like the magnificent 7 taking from seven samurai and um there was a couple of other ones as well different westerns taking from samurai films and things like this and you think like yeah you know very often they sort of follow it pretty close but they make enough of a difference that they legally don't get ruined in you know by being sued you know um but this was more like no it's just the same (laughs) it's just like can you even come up with like a different planet killing thing you know like the the sort of uh yeah the, the so-called you know the empire previously and they've gone like well like they had a good idea but you know it was horribly flawed by having that you know fatal you know channel which uh allowed the entire thing to blow up um you know let's think of something better this time it's like no we'll just do the same it'll be fine it's the kind of like uh world war one sort of uh, tactics you know we'll just keep doing the same thing you know it's just like yeah, yeah. oh god that's a better idea so i don't know but yeah i think it really was just an exercise in soft reboot oh do you know something that did really piss me off though uh the mis-selling of it i'm going to talk about hype briefly um because i just felt this was one thing that wound me up way more than the story you know like the story, it's its kind of like, I see why they did it. It's fine. It's not the end of the world. You know, I, I'm the kind of person who can watch films and TV shows just over and over and over and over and over and not get bored. My family hate it because I can watch like the same thing like 10 times over and not get bored of it. So it's not about, for me, not having something new to get my teeth into. I'm very much a person who can just consume stuff over and over and not get bored. Um, but something that really wound me up is and I hate is being like missold or mishyped or whatever. And um, 
Phasma was one of those mm. things. Like, what the flipping hell? You know, all of the marketing, like, and you think, like, holy Christ, this character is going to be the shit. Like, look at it. You know, what's going to be going on with this character? Turns out, literally nothing. It's like, <laughs> yeah. For Christ's sake. And she wasn't the only one as well. Like, you know, all of the marketing and hype, like the characters are coming back and, you know, you're going to have Luke in there and stuff. And I was thinking, damn, you know, okay, so Luke's going to be back in. We're going to get to see him, like, training some people up or, you know, he's going to be in the mix. No, they just make some vague reference to him. And then, um, you know, we get to the end of the film and we just, you know, Ray interrupts him having a cheeky piss off the cliff, you know? Yeah. (laughs) It's just like, (laughs) she comes to him and she's like, she brings the thing and he's like, oh shit I've been like here all this time and she comes now while I'm having a piss off the cliff and it's like <laughs> and he's going like yeah yeah I'm just being poignant he's like okay I'll just film. She turns around yes uh, <clears throat> I am Master Luke but it's like that's what I that's what I thought of when it's like it's just like oh my god um, but yeah those were the two things that really wound me up it was just like I was expecting to see more screen time of Luke than like a vague stare at the end of the film you know it's like yeah yeah no I I, I completely agree um, I mean, to me, perhaps I, I didn't actually watch that much of the sort of uh, the hype bait or whatever you want to call it. You no, know, I or, didn't either. But the stuff that I did see of it, posters, a couple of trailers, bits and pieces like this, it was enough to inject an impression into my head, you know? Yeah, yeah. But I, I guess the way I sort of felt a little bit missold. And again, just, just, to, uh, just to say, I didn't feel it was a bad movie. But I did feel a little bit missold on the fact that I w- at least was expecting something new, and it didn't really give me that. Um, yeah. Which again is sort of returning to my prior point. But if there's a way in which I felt missold, that was probably it. One thing that I loved was going back to having more kind of non kung fu style, um, you know, sword fighting or whatever variation of um, you know martial art they use, because there's a lot of different martial arts. Um, but yeah rather than having people flip flying and jumping and spinning all over the place um this time it was much more a kind of fencing not, almost medieval style i suppose of combat where it's like cha cha you know and a bit more like a bit more kind of like uh double-handed sword fighting you know where they'll sort of they have a bit of a fight but you know those double-handed swords that they would use in medieval times the the base of the um the handle was often heavy so that when they were fighting they could actually use it to smack people in the face with you know because if you actually look at those old medieval swords the bottom has often got this big ball on the end well that's not it, yeah and it, it part it's partly a balanced thing right so it's it's partly for the balance of the blade isn't it to sort of you know keep the weight correct but it's also if you're in combat you can break someone's nose with it you know that's what it's for if you're in a bit of a fight cling 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 smack them in the face and that's what that fighting felt like to me it was a bit more like shing 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 bang um and also i think because in the first couple of films it actually makes a lot of sense when you think about that transition because in the first couple of films they're in this kind of society where the Jedi have been trained years and years and years so they have got that kind of refined art down you know whereas now all of that has fallen apart and they're almost kind of just improvising and learning their own techniques so they don't have any of that going on um I suppose the only one that didn't really make sense in that context is Obi-Wan when he meets Darth Vader in episode four because it's like in the earlier films, he's like, ah, sure, sure, sure. And you can even see like that Yoda is like very strong and stuff, um, even though he's very old. But then suddenly Obi-Wan is like, I'm just going to have a little, pshish, pshish, you know, like, <laughs> we're just having like a little stick was, fencing fight. He was trying to get himself killed. Essentially. Yeah, he was, baby. So he was not trying. He's just like, yeah, he's yeah. like, what the fuck ever, I don't care. But, uh, <laughs> you know, but, kind of, but, but yeah, so I actually quite like that. Did you like that or did you prefer the more kind of jumping all over the place, spinning around uh, style fighting? I think visually I preferred the jumping around sort of style stuff. But I think, as you said, that there's a logical reason for it, mm. uh, for it to be absent in, in this film. Um, so, yeah, I was essentially fine with that. Um, I did find it kind of hard to believe that uh finn was able to just pick up a lightsaber and just yeah, totally. battle kylo ren yeah with literally no problem yeah and kylo ren just like i'm just gonna forget that i have the force for the entirety yeah. of this battle yeah like, yeah it really you know, really just, was yeah especially yeah. earlier on 
when you see how powerful he is. Yeah. And, you can and then he's just like, badass. yeah, you know, he's literally just like crushing things left, right and center with the force. And he's so powerful. You know, in the very beginning of the film, they established that he has massive force power um, by like holding the bolt that is uh, shot by Poe and he's just like holding it there and it's yeah. clearly a massive amount of energy because he's holding it for ages and when he walks away it nearly destroys uh, the container that it hits um, and so yeah it's just like oh in this one specific instance I'm going to use no force powers whatsoever even though this guy is not a Jedi and I could literally stand here and not even use a lightsaber I could probably yeah. he could have taken that lightsaber out of his hands with his force power but he's just like nah I'm just gonna it's cool you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, and I, I actually heard when I was walking out the cinema and there was like some people in front of me and they were going like, oh, it was so cool to see a non-Jedi like fighting the Jedi. And I was like, yeah, it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever that he would know what to do with it, you know? And it's like, yeah. did the stormtroopers receive like uh, fencing training as standard? Don't really think so. But again, you know, this is one of these things where it's like, you know, suspension of disbelief like how far do you want to go with it do you want to get in nitpick every little thing but you're right it was one of those things that kind of stood out for me that irritated me a bit i was like this i was when i was sitting there watching i was thinking this doesn't make any sense i was just thinking like he's gonna get just horribly cut in half like it's just yeah, yeah. and he kind of did but you know if i was kylo ren and i was as bad as him i'd have made sure you know like it's, it's one of these movie things isn't it you know if that was me i'd be like well he's on the ground i'm gonna make sure and just whoosh, in the head you're done uh yeah, yeah. it's in like a hmm? even just finished it faster you know or anything i mean it's like, you know, yeah he, was, he yeah. was there i think for ray wasn't he not so much for finn finn just came in and interrupted oh yeah totally and so yeah. so you know he should have just like freaking force uh force thrown him into a tree or something yeah you know? yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, you know it's a, cla- it's a classic yeah. movie thing. There's very few films who do kind of like finishing other people off properly. Um, I think the only one I can think of is like Collateral. Um, and it was a totally unnecessary sequence, actually, but it was very cool. Um, in Collateral, um, when uh, he's fighting, the, the couple of guys come along in the alleyway uh, to sort of steal um, his briefcase or whatever. And then he goes after them and he takes them down like proper sort of Hitman style. Like psh, psh, he's like double taps both of them in like a second. Um, and then when they're on the floor, there's one guy and he just pff, finishes him off in the head. And it's like, fucking hell. Like, you don't expect it because it happens so infrequently in films. Usually once they're down on the ground, the film's like, that's all right. That's all the level of violence we need. No, he's just like one in the head for good measure. And it's like, fucking hell, man, calm down. Um, but yeah, in, in sort of more family films, yes, obviously he wasn't going to just cut his head off. I get it. But I'm just saying, just saying, like, if it was, you know, if it made logical sense, he'd, he'd be sure about it. Um, but yeah, so that was one thing that kind of bugged me a little bit there. But um, Kylo Ren, what did you think of him overall? Like, I I originally was really on board with him. Um, I still feel quite con- conflicted about him as a character because very initially I was on board with him. You know, he had the mask and I was thinking, okay, so he's either something we haven't seen before or he's had some horrible disfigurement similar to Darth Vader. Again, I suppose if he had, people would say, well, that's just a repeat of Darth Vader. But um, the, the, I just assume that's why it was. And then you, when you see him getting angry and he just starts like r- lashing out at everything, that I actually liked a lot. I thought it was great because it shows his frustration and like he can't deal with what's going on with him maybe or something like this he's got this rage that he needs to get out and he's just like unleashing it on everything and everyone's like i I did laugh when the stormtroopers were like heard him like absolutely messing the room up and they're like yeah not dealing with that this morning let's just go back and get another coffee or something you know but uh yeah yeah what did you think of him as a character um my actually my my first reaction in some ways was almost the opposite of yours i felt that he was a bit too emo kind of and yeah i, think I was, go, I was gonna say like that. yeah that was my next thing to say i mean it, it is obvious he's got the whole teenage angst bullshit going on but and I, maybe that's what they want to do to sort of have him identify with uh you know an, a certain demographic in the audience i don't know but like angry at their parents they're like Aah. but like um i i don't know it's like i i it makes sense though in a way kind of I don't know. I, I str- this whole thing about like Luke was training people and then he just kind of went off the wrong path. Like how? I don't really. I guess... They haven't really expanded on that enough to sort of make have it make any sense. I guess. I suppose there's any number of plausibilities, you know. Yeah, yeah, stuff exists. Uh, I, I think also perhaps one thing that really struck me as somebody who's read the expand universe stuff is he's kind of a carbon copy of a expand universe character character oh yeah i heard um, this obviously i haven't read this but go on tell me 
Yeah, I mean, visually, he's he's very, very similar to Darth Revan, which is from the KOTOR, uh, not to the Republic series. But as a character, he's extremely similar to Darth Cadus, um, also known as Jason, which was his original name. He's also the son of uh, Han and Leia. He's also trained by um, by Luke. But his reasons for turning to the dark side are a little bit more apparent, at least so far. Uh, he has a sibling that's, like, brutally killed. Um, and he... I, if I remember correctly, he like feels guilty for the reason why his sibling was killed. Um, his sibling was also sort of like the perfect child kind of thing. Um, and so like a whole series of events, uh, including some like really brutal torture uh, that he received, uh, you know, was uh, resulted in him turning to the dark side. And he became a very sort of interesting and complex character because of that. Mm. So far, Kylo Ren doesn't, although he's very similar sort of in terms of plot and uh, uh, character, he doesn't have all that background that Darth Cadus did. Yeah. And so he feels a little bit flat to me at the moment. I mean, you know, I'm sure he will be expanded upon. Um, but I guess my, my biggest worry about him, uh, you know, obviously he is the son of um, ha, uh, Han and Leia. But my biggest concern actually is that Rey is going to also turn out to be this the daughter of Luke or something like that. And so we're going to get another like sibling family thing going yeah, on yeah that was something is... else that i'd heard a lot of kind of yeah people sort of voicing similar concerns that they don't want to have like more family values going on do you know what i mean it's yeah, like yeah yeah this is Just... what everything before that was about essentially and so again it'd be more repetition which we've seen it's been done you know yeah it's like you're my father this and that and going different ways and it's like yeah it is it's kind of want to push it in a different direction. I think the obvious thing that a lot of people have said is, you know, in the next film that people want to see something different and, and so on and so on. Don't know whether that's going to um, actually sort of come to fruition. Like a lot of people are saying, like, oh, Ray's going to lose her hand in the next film because <laughs> Anakin loses his hand, Luke loses his hand, and she's thinking, shit, I'm next. So... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know, but I, I think like um, one thing we'll just sort of finish maybe with saying talking about the film. Um, maybe we'll talk about a couple of other things, I guess. But also, um, we're coming back to the nostalgia. Something I wanted to say about we were talking about before was with kind of the pointlessness of nostalgia. You know, like why why does it always have to be this kind of like oh we'll just make something that's been before because people feel really comfortable with it. I'm actually really on board with George Lucas with this, and maybe it's the designer and the artist in me. I just feel like once something has been done, it, it's pointless just kind of rehashing it over and over again. I mean, this is something we see in video games all the time, you know, that people just get annoyed with people with stuff being rehashed because, yeah, you have seen it again. Star Wars seems almost unique in this kind of weird, obsessive, almost fetishist-like kind of attitude of things, you know, where they're kind of like, it must be like this all the time, you know. It's like people have got some weird... Thing for retro movies I actually am because George Lucas actually said this recently in the last few weeks where he said like um, you know we're forced they, they forced through this kind of retro style film I think it's totally true you know I, I don't really get why it's it's the I can't think of maybe another example like it where people are completely obsessed with it essentially just making the same thing again I just can't get my head around it I don't know what do you think about the sort of nostalgia -ness? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think there's a certain value to nostalgia. Yeah, it's nice to have a nod to it, but just what, going overboard, right? Yeah, I, I feel like this film's overboard in that respect, definitely. Um, one thing I sort of think, too, is uh, <laughs> Star Trek, actually. I'm not a big Star Trek fan, so I actually haven't watched that much of it. But from what I understand, um, the series that followed the original series were very, very similar in nature as well. And they've very much played upon that nostalgia factor by reusing characters like, oh, you know, this character's older, he's come back now or, you know, things like that. Um, and I've had some people say to me, I don't know whether this is sort of a popular consensus among Star Trek fans, but that some of that was overdone and some of it just didn't lead the series in great, great directions. So I'm sort of. I, I, I'm not here. like a massive, massive Star Trek fan, but weirdly, I have watched nearly all of them. 
Um, and I, I would kind of say that that's fair. Yeah, like I say, I don't follow Star Trek in the, like, the biggest way, but it's like, you know, I do subscribe to watching a lot of sci-fi, so I've watched like nearly all the Star Treks, a load of Babylon 5, uh, Battlestar, you go on and on and on, Firefly. You know, there's a load of different, I mean, there's so many, many, many series out there. There's Stargate, there's this, there's that. There's, I've watched it all through my childhood and now, and you know, so I've seen a lot of things. But yeah, Star Trek, um, I would say, is in that sense. You know, with the couple of different versions they went through from the first one uh, to Next Generation to Deep Space Nine to Voyager and then on to the new one which genuinely was the worst I mean this is way off topic now because we're talking about Star Wars but yeah just to say I mean it, it was an example of how sometimes when you kind of try something new it doesn't work but that's the whole point like it's okay sometimes you try something and it doesn't work and then you learn from that and you make something better and now the Star Trek that they're talking about, the new series of Star Trek they're talking about making, is going to be a lot better because they've learned from the mistakes of the one that they tried and didn't work. So just because you have a um, a hit, something which is a success, 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 doesn't mean that you know you cu- you suddenly have to have that success going on. It's kind of a bit like sports, isn't it? You know, where when somebody wins something many, many times, the pressure just gets greater and greater. You can't just you know, if you're a sports person, you can't just infinitely win stuff. You're going to have a point where it doesn't work out, right? Um, and I guess films for me are kind of something like that, you know? It's like you can't always have, like, a perfect recipe. Um, and I think with films especially, it'd be kind of boring if they did. You know, you've got to try and push it out in different directions and see where you can go with it a little bit. Um, but I will say that, like, J.J. Abrams, I like his films, you know? I like his films. I think he has a good balance of sort of action and... Um, a sort of more thoughtful but not too thoughtful within the context of the style of films you know I don't think it's we're going to see a Star Wars movie which is you know um, a sort of you know a very sort of intellectual thought out film because that's not what it's about that's not the style of film it's it's a it's a family action film but at the same time is it a family film I guess it is family action film and so, you know, you have to kind of rein in some of the kind of more extreme ideas within that sense because you've got to pull it back a little bit, right? But at the same time, that doesn't mean that we we have to just kind of keep cycling through the same stuff over and over and over, right? Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. Um, so let's, that's, that's our kind of thoughts about the film, guys. You can drop down your thoughts below about what you thought about it. Um, but I would say, like, ultimately, I'm going to say for me and Flame, you know, we both enjoyed the film, but I feel like, you know... <sighs> There's plenty of stuff there that I enjoyed. There's plenty of stuff that I didn't enjoy. Overall, I loved the look and feel of it. You know, it was a really visual feast. You know, it looked great, mm. felt great. Uh, a lot of the characters were really, really cool. I did get a little bit sad about Stormtroopers just kind of annihilating everything off the face of the earth. I felt they really pushed that angle as well. You know, the kind of like, these are the bad guys. And there was definitely mm. a bit of sort of, you know, the classic, classic, like, oh, look at them all, you know, having big... Um, uh, big sort of um, speech conference, you know. It was a, there was a bit of Nazism going on there, wasn't there? Really, you know, with the oh, guy, yeah. Yeah. you know, up in the, uh, do, he's shouting out with the huge, you know, red banners, and he's like, ah, you know, this is what we're going to do. And I was just thinking, uh, you know, could you be a bit more on the nose about it, please? You know, it's like it's these, space. yeah, it's just like these are the bad people, and you know why. And it's just like, oh Jesus. And then if they, if it wasn't sure enough, they made sure you know by the stormtroopers essentially just um, committing genocide wherever they went. You know, it's just like that group of innocent people, kill them all. And it's just like, Jesus Christ, guys, you know, that whole uh, destroying the Death Star thing really went down badly with them. You know, they got quite pissed (laughs) off. Um, But uh, yeah. Oh, also, actually, no, no. One last thing that I had to say, which I just remembered. I'm glad I remember this. Um, That for me, there was a massive, massive nod. Some people have not said that um you know in the beginning where they destroy all the other planets D- did you think that that was coruscant for a minute i did yeah do you think it actually was i, I felt like that. it i felt like it was and i felt like it was a massive massive like middle finger to the first three films i felt like it was sort of disney saying don't worry guys we've wiped all of this other stuff out of existence now that's what it was for me but you know, you only see it for a moment and I'd probably have to go back and freeze frame and look at it. But the fact that you look at it and it had the exact same architecture and almost the exact same um, shot, because when you think about at the end of uh, Jedi, I think it is, Return of the Jedi, when they, when they the rehashed version, when they show um, Coruscant being all sort of celebratory, that definitely was the shot they show. And it felt very much when you see that and everyone's like, oh my God, it was the same shot, but not celebrating. I felt like, you know, just from 
seeing it. And so for me, <clears throat> them killing all those other planets like that, it sort of almost felt to me like they were saying, because they're talking about wiping out uh, the Senate now, aren't they? That's what they say in the film. They say, like, you know, we've extinguished this, we've destroyed it finally. So to me, that's them saying we've wiped out the Senate, it's gone. You know, they've killed Coruscant and the other planets that are all around that. Um, and for me, that's their kind of sort of like saying, you know, don't worry about the first three films, we're not going to have any more of that because we've destroyed it, you know? Uh, what did you think about it? Did well, you take that away? I, at, at the moment it happened, I thought, wow, you know, that's a really big deal. They've destroyed Coruscant. Um, but I, I kind of figured that it couldn't be because the reactions of, pe of like, uh, the rebellion, uh, or I guess the resistance as they're now called, and the major characters was kind of limited. I mean, so it's, it's their, their reactions to a lot of stuff in the film is pretty limited, though. To be fair, do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, you're talking about the. I mean, if it is Coruscant, the you know mass genocide, of, like mass genocide, literally, like in every sense of the word, of trillions of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's you, true. You figure they would be, sh and and not to mention the capital of a system that had been in place for hundreds and hundreds of years. But I think that's the whole point, isn't it? That they're taking it to the next level. You know, it's like they start with the Death Star and they start with Alderaan, and um, you know the the Empire there. But then these guys are like, it's the First Order. They're supposed to be like, yeah, we're like them, but much worse. And I almost feel like, I almost feel like that's signified in a lot of ways like i was saying before with the stormtroopers and the genocide and stuff um you don't really see that kind of horrible well it's not genocide when they're in the village sorry that's the wrong word but their extermination of people because uh they do it when they come to the bar what's the name of the woman there do you remember what's her name uh the barkeep person with a k yeah something. whatever doesn't matter the woman with goggles the woman with yeah. goggles bar and uh you know she has this beautiful bar within like 10 minutes of her being on screen they've raised it to the ground and i see him killed everyone that's there and it's like fucking hell guys and then the other time they do it in the village and in all the other three films that i've seen um with the stormtroopers in so what i'm talking about four five six right they never seem like that horrific you know they don't have that kind of like exterminating attitude they're more like sort of peacekeepers and you know if you get in their way they'll maybe give you a bit of a kicking but in this one it's like Right. Well, we've we've subdued them. Let's just execute them all. And it's like, man, I, I never got that impression from them in other films, you know. Mm. So this one seems to be like, because the first order as well is not the Empire, is it? They're under like a different set of rules, and also they're not even clones anymore. They're they're just people that have been recruited and had their memories erased and conditioned, essentially, aren't they? Right, so it's like yeah. a totally different set of rules, basically. And they're supposed to be like much much worse. So it's kind of like they're facing this much darker world than they ever did, really. Mm, yeah, I agree. Um, so that's why I it makes me feel like it's more plausible that they would destroy Coruscant. I, I feel like they wouldn't give a crap about it. They're just like, because they're more concerned about eliminating the Senate and making sure that they are the sole, you know, power in their galaxy. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you in that respect. I was just saying that it, it, it seems strange to me that people didn't react more strongly to, I mean, it wasn't just Coruscant either. Or no, yeah. Or possibly Coruscant. Uh, it was like five planets, I think they said. I mean, that's a lot of people, <laughs> you know, um... Yeah, and the the reaction was was so muted. Um, I did actually just look up Coruscant on Wikipedia, which is usually pretty reliable, and it doesn't actually say anything about Coruscant being destroyed. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean it didn't happen, and of course the movie didn't really provide. It didn't any, really. Yeah, it didn't really yeah, sort of elaborate it, it on that. Say. Um, and in fact, I was kind of surprised that not that much was. was <laughs> Maybe there. they were hedging their bets, you know, and they just were like, "Let's see what the reaction is, and then we can just work it out later," you know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, I, I don't even know. Um. I have to say the character reaction throughout was a bit meh, like, you know. True, yeah. Han and Leia, like, <laughs> I don't think that um, the character of Leia really sort of came to the fore in this film, you know, like in any shape of the world. I would have thought, I would have expected her to be a lot more authoritative, you know, mm. and she really was just kind of doing the whole, oh, okay, everyone, let's go over here. And I just kind of... I didn't get a lot of uh, out of her, you know. I would have expected she's been fighting this war. She'd be a bit more grizzled, a little bit more in your face, um, you know, not mm. just the kind of peaceful, like, hello, you know. And it was kind of like, again, it's just like we said before, there's no progression. It's the same characters almost from, you know, picking up from the last film, you know. Um, yeah, definitely. I think that was, just to say, that was, that was perhaps also partially damaged by the, the fact that there's very little explanation around a lot of things in the film like we we're saying there wasn't very very much explanation about these planets being destroyed or which planets but also there's like this resistance we don't really know what it is what it's doing is it the rebellion is it on behalf of the republic 
Is it something else? It, we don't yeah, know. We yeah. don't know much about the First Order either. We just know they're brutal. They apparently killed a lot of people, and somehow they're getting away with it. Yeah, it's true. And the same with the Rebellion, the Resistance. I, I still kind of have been like, resisting, like what? I mean, because if the First Order is clearly not sponsored by the state, who are they resisting? You know, it doesn't right. make any sense. You only have a resistance if you're resisting essentially like an occupying force or a government or something. But it's like if there already is like this Senate and then there is there, well, it, it kind of it doesn't really make sense. I don't know. So that's a bit kind of odd. Uh, yeah, it's just I, I think this is kind of the, like what we've been saying is that there's a lot of kind of familiar elements, a lot of nostalgia elements, but no actual story progression. And it, the, the, and the new things that they did introduce, they didn't explain at all. So it's kind of, and then they leave it sort of to be inferred, which I always hate because then you just get very speculative. But um, you know, let's let's talk yeah. about speculation. So we'll go on to our more kind of extreme speculations. So um, <laughs> let's let's talk about some of the the things in the first films. Now, the first one was that yeah. So this was something that I had seen um, on YouTube, and I'd sort of looked around and, and seen some other bits and pieces about this. Now, it t sounds completely, completely, completely insane. And when I first saw it, I was like, this is just going to be absolute nonsense. And what it is, is it's this speculative theory that Jar Jar Binks is actually a Sith Master. And to begin with, you go like, whatever, that sounds complete crap. Like, it, it does. It sounds absolute nonsense that the biggest clown of the whole series um, could actually be a Sith himself and uh you know i'm not i'm just gonna say as well i never really had like a massive i didn't particularly like uh, the character of jar jar i wasn't like a fan but i didn't hate him in the way that so many people seem to like he was just a bit of a buffoon he was just like a clown he was a bit of slapstick character he didn't have any like massive impact um so i never really hated him in that sense but um me and flame were discussing around this theory so the way it goes is that jar jar um he's he has a lot of sort of weird things going on with him that if you watch closely seem quite they seem more than just him being kind of weird and silly so there's stuff like the, he's often doing things in the background that if you watch are quite strange like he's not just kind of um fooling around he's often kind of messing around with stuff and he's often sort of maybe the the, the sleight of hand and the sort of uh, voice manipulation that um, the Jedi do, you see him kind of almost doing this a couple of times in the films. So there's there's moments where Padme is talking and she's making a statement, and you see Jar Jar behind, and he's actually sort of mouthing in time as she's speaking, and he's almost kind of like, there's no reason for him to be there. There's no other reason. Like, you know the clips I'm talking about, right, Flame? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and you're, would you agree? Yeah, there's there's literally no reason for him to be there on screen other than if Lucas had deliberately wanted him to sort of have an association with that moment, correct? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's, there's a lot of uh, points as well that the video brings up where he's like sitting or standing next to uh, Palpatine or yeah. Sidious. And it's like uh, he, he has no had, yeah, and he's had like no real association with Palpatine whatsoever, but he sort of follows him around. He's, he's sort of shadowing him almost a lot of the time with no real explanation as to why. And it's a really, really strange thing. And I actually remember this first time I'm thinking, why is Jar Jar, like, with this bunch of people? Like, it didn't really make any sense. Like, there's no explanation for it. He's just kind of there. And so the way this theory goes is that Jar Jar is actually potentially... Because you've got to think as well about the... We, we talked about this, Flame, that um, the title of the first film is The Phantom Menace. Well, who is the Phantom? Well, I think a lot of people infer that the Phantom is Palpatine because he's not been revealed as the Sith yet. But a lot of people now are sort of suggesting that this is actually not true, that, you know, Palpatine, you know, a lot of people obviously watching the film would understand that the actor is the guy who's the Emperor, you know. So therefore, it's a very, very obvious, you know, for us who the guy is. So it's not really a mystery. So why call it the Phantom Menace if it's if it's not really a mystery? Um and it, there's other things like Jar Jar, he has a lot of sort of moves and just general style about him, which kind of go in more, like no other pe no other characters really in the, you know, the films and the galaxy that we see have this kind of uh, movement of Jedi, right? Or Sith, you know, you see Darth Maul, the way he behaves and the way he flips around all over the place. And no other characters really do this. And I don't know, do I remember, do, or do you, do any of the other um, Gungans move around in the way that Jar Jar does? Like they're not kind of flipping really. all over the place? Not, not that I'm aware of. 
like I don't remember seeing any of them sort of doing that. They have their sort of horsey th uh, things that they're riding on, their mounts that they ride on, and they're fighting, but they don't sort of flip around like the way that Jar Jar does. And so there's a bit of sort of um, sort of talk again. That's one of the elements that people are sort of touching on that Jar Jar behaves and moves in a way which is more like a Jedi or a Sith than anything else. Um, and that he has some kind of like, you know, he's using maybe power there in order to do so. But that he's so powerful that he masks it from the other Jedi. And that they often, some of the other Jedi say this as well, don't they? When, you know, Palpa I think there's a few moments in some of the films where they make mention of feeling something, but they're not sure what. But Palpatine is not nearby or in related to those scenes whatsoever. It's usually when they're around the quarters where um, Jar Jar actually is. And and where they're going with this is that Lucas actually maybe had a potentially different idea with the films and then chickened out after the fir the reaction to the first film. And they said potentially the Star Wars fans actually ruined what Lucas's original ideas were. We end up we have Dooku come in in like the second film, basically a completely pointless character who I didn't really even understand what his whole agenda was, you know? He seemed like a really sort of flawed character. Although wasn't he supposed to be, uh, Dooku was supposed to be sort of raising an army, wasn't he, against the Sith? He was like, you know, he'd seen through the looking glass. That was it, wasn't it? Um, it's it's a little bit unclear, I think. The the general idea was that he was one of Sidious's uh, apprentices. Yeah. And he was being used by Palpatine perhaps even before he became a Sith or even knew he was, you know. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, that's right. It's a kind of, um, it's like a kind of confused sort of inference, isn't it? That he's sort of, he thinks he's doing the right thing, but actually he's not, he's been convinced, but he's not like a Sith in the sense of like Darth Vader or whatever, who's been fully conditioned. It's more that he's being manipulated, right? At least he, he originally, that may have not been the case. By, by the time the second movie happens, yeah. I'm pretty sure he is a Sith. I mean, he uses Sith lightning. Um, he, talks about you know the power of the sith and all this sort of thing yeah, yeah but he yeah. was originally a highly respected jedi in fact i think he was the master of qui-gon yeah uh which is an interesting sort of cyclical thing going on there um but yeah he he was quite powerful he was you know with the light side and everything so and he came, sort of came out of nowhere um yeah. he was mysterious in the movies even um if I remember correctly they had to like go into that uh that archive to like find out who he was yeah. or something like that, and there wasn't very much information on it. And that whole scene was, didn't really have any other reason to be there than to just yeah. establish that he was mysterious. And the reason why that's kind of semi-significant is that what we're saying is is that, you know, um, there's been some quotes from people as well that Lucas made a lot of massive changes going into the second film but because of the reaction to the first film. And so there's actually this speculation that, yeah, Jar Jar potentially, in the first instance, was... You know, Lucas's thinking was that he was going to be this Sith master, even above uh, Palpatine, and that he would sort of appear maybe in the second film more, and it would come out. Um, I don't know, Flynn. What do you think about this? Do you think it's literal nonsense, or do you think it's like actually fairly reasonable speculation? Well, there's always been a fair amount of sort of reasonable speculation as far as Star Wars goes, uh, except it's sort of come out uh, through the expanded universe in many ways. Like, uh, you may have heard the, the expression that every character in the cantina scene has a book or some kind of story now explaining <laughs> why they're there, what they're doing. Um, and so I don't see why it's sort of unreasonable to do something similar with Jar Jar, even if it is kind of on another level and it kind of interferes with the books uh, or the movies uh, in, in a sort of different way than the, say, cantina inhabitants might. Um, at the same time... Uh, I do think it is. It, it's a little bit too much in some ways. It might be overthinking it, but it does kind of seem plausible, especially if you watch the video yeah. um, and, and read some of the things that have been written about it. So I'm kind of on the fence, I guess, in a way. I, 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 kind of I, I think it's nice. Too. Yeah, it's nice to believe it's true. It's nice to think that a character is not just a crazy idiot. He's actually, there's more to it. He's like, um, what would be a good example? It, it's, it's kind of like, the, you know, the murderer who is like plays dumb but actually is way smarter than anybody else and it's kind of like that that he's playing the role of the idiot so that no one suspects him oh what is that movie it's you know what i was thinking of it's um <laughs> it's a scary movie when the really really dumb police officer like sidekick uh -huh. who's basically like this sort of um you know have the mentality he's supposed to have like the kind of brain or the mind of like a you know an eight-year-old turns out mm. to be like this you know he's the guy he's the you know the badass um but it, it, it's kind of like that you know it's that sort of um 
whatever it is it's it's the well it's it's like the sleight of hand it's the it's the distraction you know like it's the smoke mm. it's the smoke screen of of being stupid but yeah i think the best thing that people can do if they want to sort of read more about this there's a couple of videos on youtube and as i say most youtube videos with these kind of wild speculations are usually absolute nonsense but it actually makes a lot of sense. It really does when you watch it. And I'm not one to sort of usually buy into these kind of things. But the more you sort of watch it and then you go back and watch the films, it does. there does seem something kind of slightly off about Jar Jar, you know? He makes kind of weird comments and he sort of often slightly backhanded things, doesn't he? You know? Mm. Like he slates people behind their back and stuff. And he's, he's generally got like this kind of weird demeanor about him. It's like if you go into it, watching it, thinking that, if you go into it watching, thinking that Jar Jar is actually a bad character and then watch how he behaves, suddenly it seems a lot more plausible. He seems actually mm. like not a particularly pleasant character. Yeah, he does help them out, but to what end, you know? It's like just because, just because you're helping other people, it doesn't mean that you don't have some other agenda. And there is all the, you know, the classic sort of cliches of, you know, keep your, uh, keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer and all that kind of stuff going on. Um, there's a lot of times in the film where Jar Jar kind of like backhand slates them and, and makes sort of like, you know, derogatory comments aimed at them in the kind of way that like a, a nasty sort of unpleasant Sith might, you know, sort of just kind of dissing them basically saying like, you don't you guys don't really know what you're doing. You don't know what you're talking about. Mm. Um, I don't know. It's a weird thing. And the sort of, I guess, implication is that he, he just doesn't have an agenda because he's kind of stupid um, or, or clumsy. But then you have to sort of wonder, how did somebody without any agenda, and somebody who's completely stupid, uh, first off, why was he just promoted to general in, uh, of this army? There's no real clear reason why. And secondly, uh, how did he somehow become a powerful senator in the Senate with the capacity to apparently uh, give the chancellor emergency power, something that hadn't been done presumably in quite a long time, a very significant move. So suddenly this person goes from being a complete idiot, completely clumsy person, um, and only over a few years becomes one of the most powerful individuals in the, in the Republic. Yeah, but That's wasn't, I, I kind of, the way I sort of originally, and I, I thinking at it now is probably wrong, but when I first watched it, without really sort of having this kind of later insight or sort of thinking around the topic, the way I sort of looked at that originally was that uh, he had maybe been sort of almost like, um, what would be the word, I uh, you would probably know better in sort of politics. You know, when you have someone who's in place, who's maybe like... Um, a puppet? Yeah, like that. That's how I kind of inferred him being put in place, that he was more like a puppet. Do you not think that's like a feasible explanation for that? Or it, is, you... it is a feasible explanation. I mean, you could say that Palpatine essentially yeah. you know, maneuvered him into place. That's, that, that's how I thought of that. it. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly but how I thought of it. But... You, would, you would sort of think that uh, the senators, presumably being fairly politically savvy themselves, yes. would realize this at least to some degree and then yeah. why would they they know, almost give him unanimous support don't they they're like yes like he comes up and says we're going to do this and everyone's like yeah it's the right thing to do and it's just like really like nobody disagrees with him and nobody nobody's been around and seen how much of an idiot this guy is you know it seems yeah. really unbelievable i mean given that it's a, a sort of democratic system as well yeah. you'd think that you know there'd be some sort of like footage or something somebody would have noticed beforehand and spread the information around that prior to getting into politics this guy was like a complete idiot and, yeah. and you know messing around and things i mean yeah, you know, let's, let's not make any trump references here flame like. <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't made any trump references <laughs> but you know you could say that you know information has a tendency to sort of leak out in in elections and things about people's prior activities and yeah. so it seems weird to me that nothing like that would happen with jar jar given his behavior yeah and and so so there is this going on guys and as i say if you watch the films back and and really watch and i mean do you think lucas is the kind of filmmaker who would actually um be that subtle you know because he and this is the only other thing that i struggle with but i mean the the overall thing is that what we're suggesting and it's not confirmed and i would like to see it confirmed or at least sort of said one way or the other it's not true or it is true but lucas you know um he's sort of that, that maybe this was his idea to have this character in that and then expand on it later. This is something that he does a lot in his film. You know, he kind of adds in elements that then will be expanded later in a very subtle way. And I think, you know, one comparison that gets made in the video on YouTube is that like Yoda, when they first, when, when Luke first meets Yoda uh, in the second film of, or, sorry, the second film of the first lot, uh, episode five, when they first meet Yoda, uh, Yoda is like this bumbling idiot. 
you know? And he's mm. like, he has a little fight with R2-D2 and he's like banging him with his stick and going, rah, 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 rah. and you're thinking, oh God, what is this crazy little man? Um, turns out he's actually like the most powerful Jedi. And so it's like, you know, there's a little bit of that going on there as well. And Lucas, is, so I guess what you would say is Lucas is known for introducing characters who at first glance seem completely ridiculous, but turn out to be actually really powerful. And it's that kind of, you know, distraction thing going on there. Um, but then there's a little bit, um, <clears throat> there's a little bit more to it as well, isn't there, Flame, in terms of um, Darth Pla- uh, Plagueis, or is it Pla- Plagueis or Plagueis? Plagueis, something like Plagueis. that. But uh, Palpatine mentions him, doesn't he, as being, was he like the most powerful Sith? He was definitely his master, at least, and he apparently had the power, which nobody else so far has had, to conceive life through the Force. You know, he was the origin of Anakin, yeah. essentially, yeah. which is pretty big. Um, and he has, does he also, he potentially has the power to reincarnate himself as well in a sort of slightly, um, you know, Buddhist way of sort of, you know, coming back into another, or is it, would it be Buddhist or would it be, um, Hindu? what are that? Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, Hindu, the kind of reincarnation. We're not to say we're not, we're not making any religious statements here, but I'm just saying that there's, there's other, there's religions which, which talk about reincarnation and in a very similar way to that, because uh, Jedi is, is kind of, it's sort of a religion in a way, I suppose, you know, it's, it's, it has mm-hmm. elements of religion to it. Um, that, yeah, um, Plagueis, he had this power, uh, so powerful that he could almost use the Force to kind of reincarnate himself into other people. And so I think, yeah, that is hinted at. And it's, is it spoken of as well in the Expanded Universe? Is that ever mentioned that you know uh, of? In the Expanded Universe, I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, they go into a bit more detail about uh, Darth Plagueis. Plagueis. Um, and I'm pretty sure it was even said in the movie that his quest prior to presumably being killed by Palpatine, his apprentice, was seeking eternal life. Yeah. Uh, so that would line up interestingly. And if you wanted to sort of speculate even more about Jar Jar, you could say, well, maybe he reincarnated himself or, or you know, put his mind into the body of Jar Jar. And the reason Jar Jar was so weird and clumsy was because he was just coming to terms with being in a new body, being you know, taking over the personality of this other person. I don't know. I mean, you know, again, it's a lot more speculation. Yeah, you can, like, you know, you can just expand on it any way you want to, yeah. really, can't you? But, I mean, it's it's cool to think about, and um, I do like the idea of it. Uh, it would just make a... It would make a kind of fairly tedious, drab story a hell of a lot more interesting, you know, um, mm-hmm. to have that kind of stuff coming in. But, again, do you think that Lucas would do that? Do you think he would have so subtle a character? Well, I... I don't know if it would necessarily be completely beyond him. I mean, if, if we look back to what you referenced before with uh, THX 3-something. 1138, yeah. 1138. I mean, that was a pretty cerebral, cerebral movie. It, um, yeah, it is. It's actually, like, if you go watch it, guys, it's actually quite a hard film to follow. It's, um, I would definitely say it's like an intellectual film because there's long, long periods of sort of maybe not a lot of vocalization happening or, or narrative. You're left to infer quite a lot. Um it's a very com- it's a long film. It's a tiring film to watch as well. It's one of these. I would actually say it's kind of on a par with sort of something like Solaris, which is a very very kind of yeah cerebral sci-fi film. Um, orig- well, both the original and the newer one. The original one is a hell of a lot better though. Um, but yeah, so you know that's the point. Is like Lucas. He doesn't just. He's not bloody. Um... God, what's that terrible director? Of Transformers. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, like how you knew straight away when I said terrible yeah, director. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I don't even yeah, care, um, whatever. But Michael, him, Michael Bay, yeah, of course, of course, of course it is, of course it is. Why, why, why? That would just go out of my head. But yeah, George Lucas is not Michael Bay, right? He he has made like films like THX One One Three, uh, which are way more um, thought out. So I wouldn't put it past him to put something like this in but very clearly it didn't follow on into episode two and three and you know for whatever possibility was going to happen it obviously now will never happen uh which kind of sucks you know but there was such a horrific reaction uh to jar jar in episode one it potentially you know you want to go as far as saying the fans essentially killed what could have been awesome films in episode two and three you know because we don't know what Lucas maybe had planned, if indeed he had anything different planned. Um, but as I say, from uh, some people that apparently worked in the first film uh, he, and, and the second, that 
he did make very, very severe changes. Now, that's not unusual in films that they make gigantic changes. Very often scripts go through three, four, five versions before, uh, screenplays, I should say, come go through like three or four, five different versions. Uh, I remember Blade Runner, like uh, the stories around that was that, you know, the original screenplay for Blade Runner had, you know, about three or four or five different rewrites some of them very, very significant, you know, completely mm. ripped apart, chopped sections out, put it back in. You know, so that's not unusual when they're making a film to like just completely destroy things. Maybe as well, Lucas, maybe it wasn't so much chickening out. Maybe he just felt like, ah, do you know what? People just hate Jar Jar so much that that thing is not going to work, but there's other stuff I can do which will work. And he maybe just decided to go in a different direction. It's, it's a lot of speculation, but I mean... I just think it's a really interesting concept to work around. And the whole plagiarist thing coming in there, it does, you know, it, it makes sense. It, that's, the, that's the thing. It's not illogical. You know, it does right. make sense. And as I say, it's backed up for me by the fact that if you look, it's, it's not just about the literal facts of who's doing what in the film. It's the behavior of Jar Jar. Like, it, I think people get, it's almost like, it's almost like Jar Jar, if indeed this was the, the you know, the, the way it was, right, that that's the character he was meant to be. It's almost like if you watch Jar Jar in the film, he he succeeded not only in uh, completely um, fooling all of the characters, but also the entire audience as well, you know, like mm. nobody picked up on it. But I say, seriously, guys, go back and watch the films, watch the films and look at the way Jar Jar behaves. It's, he's odd, like he, he isn't just um, a fumbling clown. Like you see the, the look in his eyes sometimes when he's in the, specifically when he's in the background scenes, not when he's actually literally talking to people, but usually background scenes. Watch how he behaves. He behaves oddly, you know, and as I say, he does do this thing. There's a couple of times where he does it, where he mouths when, you know, when he's mouthing words sort of almost in time with you know, main characters like Padme, I think specifically Padme, it tends to be whenever she's speaking, doesn't it? Because you remember that she was the one who kind of, in the first film anyway, she had the kind of power, didn't she? Because she was the sort of princess emperor or whatever. Yeah, so yeah. She, so she was in control. Yeah, so she was the one who was telling people what to do. She was the one telling the Jedis, like, what to do. She was like, we're going to do this, we're going to go here, we're going to do that. And there's several times where when they're asking her stuff and she gives them a response, you see Jar Jar in the background kind of mouthing at the same time that she's talking. And as I say, why would he be doing that? You know, it, it doesn't make any sense. We'll just finish talking about like one last thing then that's sort of away from the films a little bit, um, which is uh, all the expanded universe. Now, there's been so much talk about like Disney essentially just uh, killing dead all the expanded universe stuff, which seems a shame to me if that's true. I mean, like in Warhammer 40,000, uh, you go, I mean, you know that I love the law of that. Flame does as well. Um, in Warhammer 40,000, again, there's reams of, of books and expanded lore and stuff like this. But Games Workshop, when they make changes to lore, they tend not to be absolutely crushingly sweeping. I mean, I know that recently they did make some big changes and stuff. But overall, they tend to make not, not make such really, really harsh changes to the lore. And I think a lot of uh, series tend to not be too harsh with their lore changes. But for Disney to come in and just say, that's all gone, that seems a bit full on, doesn't it? I mean, what do you think about that, Flame? Because I know that you've read a hell of a lot more of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, it, on, on a certain level, it, it definitely bothers me because it means that the universe, essentially, that I have come to know and love uh, over the past 10 years, 15 years, uh, is sort of ending in a sense. Um, you know, there won't be very much more of it uh, because most of, I think, what they're encouraging now is the, is the, new, uh, the new canon, essentially. Um, but at the same time, I, I've kind of come to terms with it. Uh, because after all, George Lucas himself and um, Lucas Arts already did a lot of sort of messing around with uh, the expanded universe. I mean, they they made um, uh, the Clone Wars TV show, which sort of just strode into and often across uh, large portions of expanded universe content and effectively rendered them uh, obsolete, fake, non-canon. Um, so it, it wasn't something that we hadn't seen before in some ways. And again, I've sort of come to terms with it by just sort of saying, well, um, everything that comes after this now, I can sort of almost view it as my own non-canon, in a sense. You know, ultimately, it's up to me how I view the movies yeah, totally, and the yeah. books and things. Yeah. And, you know, if I care more about what came before, I can care more about it. There's still yeah. tons of expanded universe things for me to read. It's very expansive. Does it have problems? Absolutely. I mean, there's some comics out there. They're completely insane from the expanded universe stuff. There's some of it that goes like hundreds of years after, you know, Luke dies 
there's tons of it that goes, I think, 25,000 years before the Old Republic, uh, or, you know, the, the Clone that Wars. That sounds pretty damn cool, to be fair. Like. <laughs> Which, it's, it's cool stuff, but, I mean, some of it is almost, like, too dense. There's, there's almost too many uh, things that almost contradict themselves or just yeah. don't add up. Uh, because, again, it's about 20, 30 years of, of content that has been written by so many different authors. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, this is the thing with, like, Warhammer 40,000. It's the thing that I know... Uh, you know, very well. And with Warhammer 40,000, that's the way that I see it, is that, you know, with Warhammer 40,000, there is many, many, many different sort of pathways and routes uh, with the law, and things change. And, you know, there's some facts, for example, that uh, nobody can really identify with uh, in 40K. There's some, there's, because it's just not written about enough, or things like this. So everyone says, well, there's one fragment of information here, and that must be the absolute truth. And it's like, no, that's just like one little thing that some author threw in at one point, you know? So it doesn't necessarily mean that it's 100% true. I mean, there's, there's stuff in Warhammer 40,000 about the lost... Uh, Space Marine Legions and what happened there and you know were they corrupted by chaos was that why they disappeared essentially where that comes from is one mention in one book uh, from I think like Rogel Dawn to another character uh, I think it's um, um, uh, Malkador actually and they sort of it, it's like one sentence and from that one sentence everyone's like right that's it we know what it is now and it's like no <laughs> it doesn't work like that but also with law I, I always feel like law is something it's fiction as well at the end of the day it's fiction you know people need to keep their feet on the ground sometimes you know I love my using your imagination and keeping it out there and, and sort of like we've been doing you know you speculate and you talk and it's, it's interesting but it's fiction. Keep your feet down on the ground, okay? If something changes, it's not the end of the world. And, you know, it's like you say, it's up to you what you want to believe. That's the whole point. You know, it's like just because they say this is the official line, you're like, oh, that's cool, but I actually like this a lot more, so I'm just going to keep reading this. You know, it's like, and people always do unofficial things, and often the unofficial things are a hell of a lot more interesting than the official things anyway. And mm. surely you just want to stick with the thing that you think is a lot better, right? You know? So. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of uh, Star Wars fans of the Expanded Universe were really hoping this movie would uh, basically bring to life the uh, Grand Admiral Thrawn trilogy which has often been regarded as one of the strongest, the best pieces of Expanded Universe content. Uh, it was written not too long after the movies, and um, I think it received a lot of uh, accolade uh, after it was released. Uh, but of course, you know, that didn't happen. But as somebody who really enjoyed those books, I can you know, view that as I want to, as essentially overriding uh, what Disney's made. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm all the happier for it. Yeah, definitely. So guys, tell us your thoughts about uh, the Star Wars film. Tell us your thoughts about uh, Expanding Universe, if you're into that. And, uh, you know, feel free to throw down your own thoughts about the uh, Jar Jar Binks uh, Sith Master Theory. Uh, I have to say, of all the things that fly around that are quite speculative, it's one of the ones which interests me more. As I say, not because um, it's so crazy, but because when you actually look at the films, it actually seems really plausible. And as I say, when you couple that with the fact that we hear about Lucas making significant changes to the character and just sort of rewriting stuff, it seems very interesting. So drop your thoughts down below about that, about the new film, everything in between. And if you enjoyed this series, uh, maybe we'll talk about it a little bit more in the future when other things come along or just if we have something to, uh, a topic to discuss around. So uh, thanks for watching, guys, and uh, see you next time for some more podcast discussion.